Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'll be talking with Jay Woods of Freedom Capital Markets from the floor of the NYSE. We'll talk about some of the earnings names, some of the names on the move, some constructive and challenging patterns. I think this market is filled with both. Let's look at them together. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of Stock Charts. The Stock Charts platform was designed to empower investors to better understand the markets around them using the benefits of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is really based on supply and demand, fear and greed. And I will tell you, if you read books about investing and it talks about investors being rational, spend just a few moments actively inv involved in the markets. You will find, I, th I feel, that uh, investors are as irrational as ever. And we're seeing a lot of those movements here through the course of this week. We sort of have this quiet waiting period before some inflation data, jobs data, all of these things come out through the course of the week. While the major average is pulling back a little bit and in a choppy phase, continuing to be in this choppy period, a lot of individual stocks are on the move. We've got some earnings this week that are causing uh, stocks in the energy sector, some technology names and others to uh, have some moves to the upside and the downside. We'll break out some of those charts here through the course of the show and focus on key levels and patterns to focus on. With that as a starting point, let's get into our market recap. As I mentioned, sort of a choppy period. We've been talking about that for quite some time with a lot of our guests. We've been digging into the choppy uh, environment in this, uh, in this market. But today really netting out to more of a negative than a positive day. And that really happened through the afternoon going into the close when things really started to roll over. The S&P finishing down about half a percent. That's just below 4,120. So still above 4,100, which is important. But, you know, stalling out in attempts to get above 4,200, we remain pulling back uh, off of that significant level of resistance. The NASDAQ composite leading the way lower down about 0.6 percent. Mid caps and small caps all in the red as well. Only things in the green here, really the VIX, right, which is pushing higher a little bit, uh, back above 17, around 1770. So the volatility environment remains low, right? And a general back of the envelope level for the VIX is the VIX above or below 20. A VIX above 20 means we're in a volatile environment based on my basic definition of it, which means uh, uncertainty elevated, uncertainty elevated instability, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, potential for a lot of movements. A low VIX of below 20 means we're sort of in that choppy unknown phase, sort of settling into a, a range. And that's pretty much how I would describe the current market environment. But again, a day like today ending with sort of that waterfall decline into the close, not really the, uh, the end of the day that you want to see if you're more on the bullish side of the coin uh, with the current markets. Interest rates, not a ton of a change, to be honest with you. The 10-year yield, pretty stable from where it was yesterday. A little movement on the 30-year and the 5-year points, but overall, the yield curve remained uh, fairly stable. The dollar was up about a third of a percent, not enough to really cause any issues uh, elsewhere in the markets, but uh, certainly not trending downwards uh, today. Commodities a bit mixed. Gold was actually in the positive. The GLD finished today up 0.7%. That's in one of the stronger charts. I mean, if you ask me to find the strongest charts year to date, I'd be focusing in a relatively small group of things, right? Uh, technology and, uh, and big communications names, things like the FANG stocks, semiconductors, gold and gold stocks would certainly be in there. Maybe home builders, uh, maybe some healthcare stocks. Uh, but it's a relatively small number. And interesting to see, even on a down day, you're having gold continue to push to the upside. Gold, uh, spot gold, testing all-time highs above $2,000 an ounce. Oil prices moving up a little bit uh, as well. And the rest of the uh, commodity space sort of flat to net positive. Mixed results in crypto land with Bitcoin, again, pretty consistent from where it was at yesterday's close, where, again, we're sort of in that choppy unknown phase. I think the, 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 uh, the market is keeping the powder dry, as it were, uh, sort of preparing and bracing for inflation data that's going to be coming through over the next uh, couple trading sessions. Those are, you know, 
potential uh, have potential for significant market moving uh, impact for sure. Just to finish off looking at the sectors here, and then we'll look at some uh, a series of charts to uh, continue to tell the story of the market environment today. Only two of the S&P sectors actually finished in the green. Industrials only got 0.2%, energy just a, a hair's breadth over zero. Uh, one was flat consumer discretionary, everything else was down. Materials, technology, healthcare leading the way lower. But again, those, the weakest sector of the day, materials, still down less than 1%. So overall, this is still, I would argue, sort of that choppy uh, sideways, the choppy slop, as it was described to me a number of times at the uh, CMT Symposium re re uh, recently in New York. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500 and see what we can see here. Now, again, what's interesting about this market is we have traded up to resistance. And that is, I think, the, the way that I would describe the S&P, the NASDAQ, a lot of individual names. Again, take the outliers, the ones that are just blowing out like a meta or NVIDIA. Take those off and just look at the average stock and it probably looks a little bit worse than the S&P, to be honest with you. But overall, you can see names that have been strong. And, and I would include the S&P in sort of that, you know, net positive sort of list. They're not trading through resistance, right? It's not making a consistent pattern of higher highs and higher lows. It's more sideways. We first reached 4,200 after the October low of last year. We first reached there in February of this year. From there, we've now retested that. And last week, we had what's called the shooting star candle, right? Where you open, you trade right up to 4,200, then close lower. And again, since then, it's been just sort of chopping around between, we'll call it 4050 and 40, uh, 4150 on the, uh, on the upper end. So we're in sort of this no man's land between a significant resistance level and the 50-day moving average, which is also the swing lows here from April and early May. So one of two things is going to happen at some point. And I wouldn't be surprised if the inflation numbers this week really provide a catalyst for the S&P, the Nasdaq, to break out of this range. The bull scenario would be we rally, we get through 4,200, which certainly opens the door to 4,300, if not more, uh, right? The ability to break above resistance, then all of a sudden we have to look left and see where else we found resistance uh, previously. But, you know, you're all of a sudden in a fairly constructive pattern if something like the S&P can get above a well-established resistance level. The downside, more the bearish scenario, is we get some inflation data that in basically implies that inflation as an issue is still very real, that the actions the Fed has taken may be perceived as not quite enough to keep inflation in check. Well, watch how quickly the S&P or the Nasdaq would break down through moving average support. Then all of a sudden you have to think about further downside targets and, uh, and, and where you would uh, you know, have downside protection, how you would play a potential retracement of 300 S&P points uh, to the downside. So a lot that could happen. Again, at the end of the day, right now, the RSI is flat right around 50. The S&P is settling into a range over the last four to six weeks. The question is, what's the catalyst to push us through here? Now, on individual stocks, we've had plenty of catalysts providing plenty of movement on plenty of stocks. And we're going to start with the three P's as I'm, uh, as I'm announcing them today. Uh, Palantir, PLTR, Plug Power, and PayPal. Three tickers with the letter P, all having significant movements here in the last day or two. We'll start with PLTR, probably a pretty good, uh, you know, pretty good earnings release for sure. Gapping to the upside, I saw a lot of uh, measured comments afterwards saying, you know, nice quarter, but let's let's uh, you know let's keep things in perspective. Uh, you know, the market overall, the environment is still challenging. Having said that, the stock gapped higher, reaching up to that potentially very important ten dollar level. Big round numbers have meaning. Uh, we can debate why that's the case and uh, and whether it should or should not be something we focus on. But I will tell you, after a number of years of following charts, big round numbers like $10, $100, $1,000 tend to have meaning. Stocks tend to have something happen right about that level. What's interesting about uh, Palantir is if you look at February's high, we traded right up to $10 a share before we rotated lower. This gap today puts us basically right up to that same level. So while this is encouraging, is it a higher low? Absolutely. Did we bounce? off of support around seven, seven and a quarter? Absolutely. Have we gotten above the resistance level yet? No. And I would say this is, again, the, the reason why I would put an asterisk on any sort of bullish uh, you know, short-term move like this one is has it gotten enough to power above resistance, right? Not just trading to resistance, but through resistance. The S&P and the NASDAQ have not been able to do that yet. You're seeing on this particular chart, again, uh, you know, get it gapping higher, which is encouraging, but it's not enough yet to get above resistance. Getting above $10 a share, that's the type of breakout that I think could make this uh, market in a very, very short fashion, very, 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 very positive, but we're not seeing it quite enough uh, to the upside yet. 
Plug Power is another one. Now, these next two are gapping a little bit lower. So before you, you think, like, these are three great long ideas, potentially, this is one that's actually moving to the downside. And what I have to remind people on the chart of Plug Power, we talked about this name a couple of years ago all the time because it was a leading name. At one point, if I remember right, this was actually the top-ranked stock in the S&P uh, scooter rankings. I might be making that up, but I don't think so. I'm pretty sure it was, it was at or near, certainly in the top 10. Now, all of a sudden, it's a mid-cap name because it's lost so much value. And you look, today's gap lower, about 14%, not encouraging. We're down to $8 a share. But what for, for me is more significant looking at this chart is how that's just the latest downstep in a trend that has been working for quite some time. Look at how many times the, that uh, Plug Power has made a new 52-week low just in the last year. Look at how many times it's rallied but has failed to get above the 200-day moving average, or in the case of August of last year, fails to get above the April highs from earlier in the year. So you have this pattern where rallies are making sh uh, lower highs and then subsequently will test and try to get above those highs and then fail to do so. So the level of resistance just keeps moving uh, lower. So this gap lower, while a, a sudden movement for sure, is just the latest step in a series of steps to the downside. That's why when someone shows me a chart that's gone down a lot and says, is this a great time to buy? My answer is, there's nothing on this chart telling you necessarily that the downtrend is over. All you're seeing is a bunch of confirmation that the downtrend is very much in place. And I would say that's what we're, we're learning, continuing to learn with something like a plug power. Now, PayPal is a tough one because this is a stock that's been in a sideways trend for quite some time. I would say just like PLTR, just like the S&P testing resistance, with PayPal, we're actually testing support. Look at the lows from June of last year. Look at the lows in December of last year. And look at where we gap down to today. We're trading just below those lows. But I would be curious to see if we get a follow through to the downside through the remainder of this week. Certainly, there's an opportunity here with earnings to have an upside catalyst to gap back above the 200-day moving average or at least stem the tide of this downtrend. For now, we're not seeing that. We're seeing PayPal uh, move a little bit lower. We have a lot of other earning names to, uh, to highlight, but one I just want to finish off uh, our market recap with is Skyworks. Now, semiconductors have been one of the more promising groups. Now, you have certain names in there that look stronger than others. Charts like Skyworks, uh, like Empower, MPWR, a lot less strong than others. What's interesting about Skyworks is it gapped lower, down around $92 a share, but by the close, got all the way back up almost to the 200-day moving average and closed just below $100 a share. So you're seeing some short-term demand, a gap lower, but accumulation during the course of the day. And a chart like this, I say the next day, that confirmation day, is vital and an important chart to watch through the remainder of this week. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back talking to Jay Woods of Freedom Capital Markets. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. It's such a blast to put this show on for you. And thank you so much for joining, with, uh, joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. A couple quick announcements before we bring on Jay Woods, today's guest. First off, we welcome your questions. We really appreciate the questions you're sharing with us as you were trying to analyze your own charts using the Stock Charts platform. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, and we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'd love to hear from you. Hope to answer your question live on the air on Friday's show. Upcoming schedule, we have a great guest today. Jay Woods is going to be joining us here shortly from the New York Stock Exchange. Tomorrow on uh, May 10th, we have Frank Capillary, founder of Cap Thesis, coming to us from New York. On Thursday, May 11th, Clint Cowles from TD Ameritrade joining us from Minneapolis. Next week, we'll have our next in-studio guest, Danielle Shea of Simpler Trading, will be joining us live from the studio here in Redmond, Washington. So a lot of great guests and perspectives to share with you, but let's get to today's fantastic and uh, well-deserved uh, expert opinion. Jay Woods is the Chief Global Strategist at Freedom Capital Markets, coming to us live from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Jay, how are you? And welcome back to the show. Well, Dave, I'm great, and it's great to be back. It was great to see you last week at the CMT Symposium, which we, we celebrated right here at the Stock Exchange. And I brought some charts that are in the news, a little topical, a little daring, if you will. Uh, two are reporting earnings as we talk. Uh, so we want to look at the risk-reward setups we're seeing in them. But, uh, you know, I, I love the crude stock charts. I love coming out to see you guys in Seattle last year. And it's a pleasure to be back and be back broadcasting here from my home at the Stock Exchange. It's awesome to see you. It was great to see you in New York. And you rang the closing bell uh, last uh, two weeks ago, which was just awesome to see. What a great moment. 
for you and, and well-deserved, but a great moment for the organization as well that you and I have both, uh, I think, had the pleasure to be invo involved with. Let's get to your charts, if we could, Jay. Uh, your first sure. chart is Occidental Petroleum. This is one of the names reporting after the close today. What do you think of the setup here in the energy space? Well, it, it doesn't look pretty. Let, let's just review. <laughs> this weekend was the big talk. Warren Buffett, everyone hanging out in Omaha. And one of the big questions was, Warren, you own 24% of Occidental Petroleum. Uh, you're going to take a full stake? And he kind of denied it and said no. And then let's look at the chart, that nice pink area of support, that consolidation. That is Warren Buffett buying it every single time. Mm -hmm. uh, we are now making a series of lower highs and back into it for the sixth time. When did it break out? When he announced he took a stake? Why did it continue to rally? Why was it the best performing stock in the S&P uh, 500 last year? Because not only did he take a stake, but it was in the hottest sector in energy. Mm -hmm. Well, energy is starting to cool, as you showed in the beginning of the show. Oil has not been really leading right now. And, you know, earnings, Occidental, has traded lower nine out of the last 12 quarters. Uh, implied volatility is just about plus or minus 4%. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get a little bit of a negative hit here, and Warren steps away, or maybe he can't support it. There's too much pressure on the stock. Uh, it can take that leg lower. To me, it, it's very toppy. I would not use support to jump into this stock. I would avoid it. It's interesting and just such a, I mean, what, a, what, a, what an incredible sideways trend now, over a year now, just sitting at the same support level. We'll see if there's enough of a catalyst after the close to sort of get out of that range. But for now, I, I totally see what you're saying. Your second chart, another earnings name, uh, Airbnb. What's the take here? Airbnb, let's go back to the very beginning. Uh, December 2020, it's IPO, it's debut. I have that nice blue support resistance area of uh, interest, as I, my friend Brian Shan would like to call it. Um, that area, that 125 to 130 area, the first year and a half it was public, consistently acted like support. And when support breaks and it breaks down, especially a key level like this, what happens? On the way back up, it acts as resistance. And what has it done over the last year? It's tested it six times. It's failed. It did give us a little bit of a bull trap last time and failed, but it didn't fail too bad. What we're mm. seeing here now is the classic inverted head and shoulders, where you had uh, you know, the shoulder on the left, a drop to a new low, 52-week low, right down in the middle, and then we, we tested it, failed, and we just retraced a little bit of that move, and now today, we close towards the highs of the day, and we're waiting on earnings to see what's gonna happen. And mm. if it does happen to beat and ri rise higher as a result of this, one more gap, that could be a great entry point from a risk reward standpoint because from this pattern you have a measured move it's roughly 30 points so we're talking a 130 to 160 measured move based on the technicals that we see here and if we get that positive report if it closes well tomorrow it, this is something you want to own into the next quarter or two because the long-term trend has definitely changed and uh it's making a move that finally broke above that key area that we're watching it's such a great chart, and I love Jay. It's sort of this, you're giving us a mini masterclass on how to think about setups and patterns leading up to an earnings release, right? I mean, a lot can happen, of course, when a company reports earnings, but having an awareness of these patterns and these setups going into the announcement and just thinking about the catalyst and what could happen after. I, I just think that's a brilliant illustration with both of those charts. We talked in our market recap about PayPal. I was talking about some of those yep. uh, similar names, obviously gapping uh, lower this week. Do you see anything to like on this chart, or is it sort of a continued downtrend in your perspective? Hey, listen, if I'm short, I love this chart. This is fantastic. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but no, unfortunately, I don't. This was a darling. This was a stock I, I had, uh, I owned for years, uh, mm -hmm. well over six years, uh, and it treated me well, and I sold it a little along the way. I am totally out of this stock. It broke a major long-term downtrend years ago. And now if you look at the gaps it took on the way down, it was significant. It, it got the COVID treatment. It, it went a little too above its skis. Now it's coming back. And now you had that perfect descending triangle. I sent this to you yesterday before earnings, and my theory was just like Airbnb. We have a measured level. This mm. is what scares me. It didn't break that trend. If it did, it had a lot to reverse, and I would have been very happy. Now, if you listen to it, Fundamentally, they beat on EPS, they beat on revenue. Uh, you know, the analysts on TV were trying to find what was negative in this, you know, something had to do with margins. It'd be probably the 13th thing on the list I would look for when I'm looking at earnings reports. But, um, you know, I follow price, you follow price. And what did we see? We saw a horrible gap down, broke major support, 
And now if we were to go back another three years, we're talking this stock is going to be testing 50 over the next three to six months. And when the one thing I don't have here is a volume bar. It had mm. record volume today. It was over 60 million shares. That is a stock I would not want to dip my toe into. Now, if it reverses and then closes above this you know, gap lower, then for a swing trade, maybe it's worth it. It's probably retest that downward trend. But um, I, I would avoid this uh, as much as any stock out there right now. Yeah, that's getting back to the Edwards and McGee kind of technical analysis 101, right? A breakdown on significant volume sort of indicates uh, avoid it. And, and it's funny, one of the reasons why this show is called The Final Bar is because you look at where we're at now and look to the left and see when we've tested it before. I have to bring in a lot more data to find the last time we were down at these levels. That tells you about some of the deterioration that we've seen yeah. uh, with that one. You're, the last stock, you have a couple charts to share with us with Salesforce.com. This is a name that, you know, certainly, I guess, uh, it's sort of the opposite of PayPal, this nice rally. What do you like here? What do you see on this particular setup? Well, this one got my attention because it made the new 52-week high list. And that's something Stock Chart sends me every, uh, every, every morning. What, what stocks are making 52-week highs, 52-week lows? And that's where I kind of, you know, the light bulb goes off. And I haven't been paying attention to it. It's in the Dow. It's a stock that I used to be a market maker in with my firm uh, several years ago. Uh, but now, it, technically, the setup is tremendous. And I want to look at it at two time frames. First, the daily chart. You have that line of resistance going back a year. You have a nice little saucer bottom, a little little handle, if you will. It's uh, not perfect, but we did break out of that range. We tested it. When we tested it, guess what? We held the old resistance, became support. We chopped sideways, and now we just broke out and closed at an all-time high on the 52-week basis. Now let's mm. go back out. What could this do, seeing that it's breaking out again? Let's go to a weekly, which I included here below. And I put a little Fibonacci levels. You know, every once in a while, you want to see how it looks on a Fibonacci base. And we're looking at the, the all-time high, about around 311. And this was, you know, going into the end of 2022 to our recent low. And guess what? On this recent rally, two things have happened. One, it broke a year-long downtrend. Mm. That's, that's a light bulb. Something's changed. This is fantastic. Okay. It continued up. Where did it go? It went right to old levels of resistance. Uh, you know, as we saw on the yearly... It, it also happened to be a Fibonacci retracement level, uh, 197 and a half. So to see that in action and now today to get the breakout, I want to see on a weekly confirmation that it closes above 200. Uh, we still have three days to go, so these weekly candles are not complete yet. But if we get that close, I think another 10% rally as we head into earnings in this stock about uh, two, three weeks from now uh, could be in the cards. It's such a great, uh, and, and again, I really appreciate it, uh, Jay. You brought a, a series of examples with some really differentiated patterns. And, it, and I feel like the setup with some of these charts that are breaking down really makes CRM stand out as one of those constructive names. We, we mentioned earlier, as I was welcoming you on the show, we went to the CMT Symposium here a couple weeks ago in New York, which was, again, such a blast. What were your takeaways? We were talking before we went live about some of the takeaways from the end. What were your takeaways in terms of the overall sentiment of the overall feel? We, we heard from some of the top technical analysts in the industry. What was your takeaway uh, in terms of a market perspective? Oh, man. Well, let, let's just go back one year when we were in D.C. Everyone was it was the most bearish, most miserable group of technicians in the world. Hey, they called it. It, it was right. So I was all excited. I wanted to hear someone just with bulls and horns coming out of their head and just standing on the table saying, this is going to break out, or, or some very bearish scenarios, and heard a lot of mumbling. Uh, we heard a lot of, you know, we're in this chop zone, sideways is a trend. These are things that I see, I believe in, but I'm a little bit more on the optimistic side, not throwing my bulls out of my uh, head right now, but um, my bull horns, that is, but... I, there are a lot of good things we're seeing from price activity. If you were, you were looking at just headlines and you heard debt ceiling crisis, if you heard uh, the Fed was making an announcement, uh, the regional bank crisis, let's talk about that. Mm. The regional banks and sovereign bank went, out, uh, went under. That was March 7th. Regional bank index is down over 30% during that time. S&P 500 is up 2%. So things aren't jiving. The, the major indexes are doing all right. The leadership is not a bad leadership to have Apple and Microsoft, 12.5% of the S&P 500, leading us. Yes, people will complain it's only two stocks. Well, no, we're starting to see progress in Google. Meta's been fantastic. Uh, Tesla, not so much. Amazon trying. But we're starting to see a little bit of a change. 
And this has become, and this is so cliche, Dave, and I hate to say this, a stock picker's market where not all the sectors are going up. If you look at the semis, you have your winners and you have your losers, but NVIDIA sure. is leading the way. Uh, we saw it yesterday with some of these uh, you know, stocks in the hack or the bug ETF, the cybersecurity names. There are a few shining stars there, and the index is making higher lows, and it's starting constructively base. So there are some positives, but the CMT group, uh, that was a flip a coin. It was, it was great to be around them and to listen to their insights all week long. Jay, it is awesome to see you. Thanks for joining us from the MYSE. Uh, be well, stay safe there in New York. We'll talk to you again soon. All right, my pleasure. Thank you. It's Jay Woods. Jay is the uh, chief global strategist at Freedom Capital Markets, longtime executive floor governor at the MYSE. And again, it was such a blast to see him seeing the CMT Association leadership uh, with Jay at the uh, helm. Uh, ringing the uh, closing bell uh, a couple weeks ago was uh, was an absolute pleasure, but really fun. And what's interesting when you listen to Jay's comments, what I love about him, I love talking with people who I feel like have a better command of making the stock charts platform illustrate ideas better than I can. And I love the way that uh, Jay was using some of the annotation tools to really show how we're hitting resistance. And in the case of something like CRM, really able to push through there. We're very close, I think, to uh, Jay's last point about things starting to turn a little more constructive, but we have to get through resistance first. That was a great take, uh, as always, by Jay Woods at Freedom Capital Markets. Folks, we have to wrap our show and go to the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. You know, when we were talking in the uh, market recap about PLTR, you know, I just want to reinforce the idea of looking at big round numbers and also a technical concept called polarity. A couple of Jay's charts, you saw him pick up on that, where a support level becomes a resistance level or a resistance level becomes a support level. That is a, a concept called polarity, where a level has meaning to a market and whether we trade above or below it, it becomes support or resistance because the level is what's most important. $10 a share on PLTR first was an important level you know, in recent history in February of 2022. Look at how many times we've bounced off of it from above or traded up to it and stalled out and, come, and came lower. Most recently, in February of 2023, we're now gapping higher, but still not quite above there. And this is what I say when there's some constructive setups. A lot of them are trading up to a key level. The question is, can they get through it? I think on the chart of PLTR, it's a little too early to make that assessment because previous rallies, even with gaps like we saw in February, have stalled out right around the levels we're at right now. So I think still to be determined. Chart number two is the gold ETF GLD. I mentioned how in today's sort of quieter session, um, you know, certain areas of the market showing uh, renewed strength. Gold has been one of the stronger places in the market, certainly year to date. And over the last six months, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a better uh, set of, uh, of trends off of the October low of last year. If you look at the GLD, I just created a quick, uh, what we call a trend channel, which is a parallel set of trend lines, one tracking the lows, one loosely tracking the highs. I sort of ignored this outlier in uh, January, but overall you can see it lines up pretty well with a lot of the other high prices. And then I put a dash line about halfway the midpoint. The reason why I want to do that is show that the trend overall has been fairly consistent. We've overshot and undershot that sort of uh, you know larger trend, which the dash line is basically tracking the overall trend during the course of this uh, phase. And we're just above the mid midpoint of this uh, trend channel. The general way to think of it is when we would start to rally, we get to the upper trend line channel. Even if the long-term trend is still positive, you may get some short-term pullbacks. We saw that most recently in March and early April. That's what I'd be watching for if we continue to rally on the chart of uh, the GLD. Final chart here, three key ratios. I'll do this quickly. Top one is stocks versus bonds. Overall, still favoring stocks over the last couple of years, but stalling out. They're sort of even recently. The second one is S&P in terms of gold. Stocks over rocks, right? And basically, rocks are outperforming by the fact that this trend is going lower. So you've been better off owning gold versus the S&P. The bottom, base metals versus precious metals also going lower. Overall, that is not a bullish sign for stocks and suggests some weakness at play. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank Jay Woods from Freedom Capital Markets joining us from New York. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night.